Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. We are incredibly grateful to Michael for always being so generous with his time and keeping us up to date on protocols and how best to manage these unknown situations we find ourselves in. Michael is very well known amongst us, so I will be brief in my introduction. Michael is a labor lawyer and the go-to man with any issues pertaining to labor law. Bagram's Attorneys is a boutique law firm well known to specialize in all labor related matters and prides itself in offering personal and practical advice to all their clients. Michael is also a South African politician. He is the shadow deputy minister of labor and employment. He is an active member of the community and advocates for job creation through re-engineered labor, re labor legislation and is a social activist. The context of this discussion is understanding the complexities surrounding this emotive landscape, mandatory vaccinations. Feel free to post comments and your questions in the chat box and Michael will address them after his talk. A reminder to please keep your microphones on mute. Thank you for your time and engaging in this conversation with us. Over to you, Michael. Thank you. Um, I'm unmuted. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for coming on board so early on a Friday morning. I'm planning to talk for just under half an hour. Um, but there are a myriad of topics under the mandatory vaccination issue. I don't even think it's a vaccination, but maybe Solly Lasson can help us with that. I see he's on board here. Um, but the reality is we have a whole heap now of uh, arbitration awards at the CCMA. Uh, the CCMA yesterday told me they've got another something like 100 referrals uh, with regard to mandatory uh, vaccination at the workplace, about 100 coming up. Uh, so we should be expecting a lot more arbitration awards. The awards thus far have been in favor of the mandatory vaccination. We haven't had one case yet in the labor court. Uh, one did arrive at the labor court. I don't know if people saw about two weeks ago, but it was thrown out because they brought it there as a matter of urgency and the judge, I think, kicked for touch and said it's not urgent. Um, so we didn't have any, any comment on the mandatory vaccination award at all. Uh, but that case is now in the queue. Uh, unfortunately, the Labour Court is about a two-year wait. So I think um, COVID-19 will be a, a history, a small thought in our mind by the time the Labour Court gets to say this. Um, and then, of course, there are two cases in the wings waiting for the Constitutional Court. But again, they're not urgent. So who knows when and if they're ever going to come forward. I just want to start right at the end of my talk. At the end of my talk, um, you will see that the Department of Employment and Labor um, has put out a, a, probably it's now, I think it's been put into regulation, but they put out a statement saying that if you're not showing any um, symptoms at all, there's no need to uh, isolate yourself, not even for one day, even if you know you're positive, and there's no need to stay away from work. Um, now, I'm going to be quite frank with you. I think that's ridiculous. Um, I think we still got COVID-19. I'm not a doctor and I'm not a virologist, so I can't tell you anything about it, but um, I can't understand how they can put out that. Uh, when we're still in a state of lockdown. So that's their latest statement, and that's what I'm going to end off with. Um, I've put in a, an article um, to a couple of magazines, in particular to the government magazines, uh, to say that I think it is ridiculous because the employer then takes the responsibility and the liability. And, of course, at the end of the day, that puts pressure on the compensation fund uh, if it's spread at work. And there probably will be a spread if someone arrives in a sweatshop to sew garments and they're not showing any symptoms, that's lucky for them. So that's the end of the talk. 
Uh, coming up to that, um, I also need to say that there's been issues now as to uh, POPIA. In other words, the Personal Information Act. If you're asking your employees to say, we need your indication as to whether you've been vaccinated or not, um, in terms of the private information, they can say, listen, it's none of your business. Uh, what do you do then? They might, in fact, have been vaccinated. Um, I must tell you up front that I've been vaccinated. Um, I've got certain comorbidities, uh, diabetes in particular, and I thought it was very important for me to be vaccinated. Um, not that my workplace uh, requires it because I never see anyone, or very seldom do I see anyone at my workplace. Everything's done, still done on Zoom. So I don't need to have done that, but for my own personal uh, well being and my own personal and physical health, um, I decided I would do that. Um, so there we are. I've put you in the picture as to where I stand, and I've put you in the picture as to where the courts and the arbitration stand at the moment. But I want to go into some of the practicalities. I also need to tell you that the universities um, have caused quite a lot of havoc in that they've said to come onto campus, and I think it's from the 1st of April, most of the campuses are clamping down and they're saying, you've got to show your certificate before you come to lectures. I don't know, in light of what I'm about to tell you about the consultation process, I don't know how they can justify that because uh, you need to look at operational requirements, but you need to weigh up the operational requirements with the individual. Um, I know one of the universities at least had said that the individuals will come forward and tell us why they don't want to be vaccinated and we'll take that into account. But the bigger universities, uh, UJ, WITS, UCT, haven't said anything like that. So it'll be interesting to see uh, where that takes you as well. Uh, we know that the anti-vax movement is getting stronger all over. Um, and in fact, not only is it getting stronger, but governments are putting out the message that, like our government has done as well, that in fact, COVID-19 is not an issue anymore. Uh, you've seen that um, very strongly in England, uh, where they've said, look, forget about masks, take it off. So I want to I make an announcement that hasn't been made yet, and I think it will be made on the 15th of March. Uh, remember, the 15th of March is the Ides of March. Uh, uh, Julius Caesar will tell you all about that. But the Ides of March uh, are uh, quite an issue um, in that I think what's going to happen here in South Africa is that we're going to have another family chat. Now, this is just my surmise, by the way. Uh, so don't quote me on this, but I think the family chat is going to tell us that there's no more lockdown and there'll be no more masks. And if in fact, and it'll be become universal in South Africa, that if you don't have the symptoms, uh, forget about it. Uh, do whatever you have to do. Go and sneeze in a, in a supermarket um, quite happily and everyone else won't be wearing masks as well. So that'll be interesting. Um, the Ides of March in South Africa, it'll be quite a day for us. Um, I think in, on the Ides of March, I'm gonna go and isolate myself at my flat in Amarnas and see what actually takes place. Okay, so let's go back. Let's have a look at how the regulations have been unpacked um, and how they've been interpreted by the CCMA, because those are the only people, it's the arbitrators at the CCMA who have been unpacking this for us. So the first thing you need to do, as per the regulations, is to understand the health and safety regulations. Okay, so the regulations put out by the Ministry of Employment and Labor have been very carefully coordinated with the health and safety regulations and these aren't new. This is, uh, in fact, pretty strong and been implemented for many years, uh, in particular with TB. So we've had a lot of experience, and especially here in the Cape Province, with TB and TB at the workplace. Now, TB is horrific. And a lot of the staff over the years have not been compliant with their TB medication. And because they've not been compliant with their TB medication, we found that there's been a heavy spread. And I've been involved in a whole lot of court cases 
with regard to TB and staff not being compliant with medication. That being said, there have been quite a lot of court cases on that. Um, so understand that um, this is not new regulation. So you take the regulator, every single business owner, every single HR, any people who are um, going to be charged with having to do the consultation process with the staff have to understand the regulations. So the first thing you do is you need to look at your operational requirements. In other words, if you bag rooms attorneys, have you got a separate office for everyone? Are people having to move from office to office? And are there people with comorbidities in the office and could be a problem? Well, after our uh, look at our operational requirements, we found that, um, first of all, uh, there was only one person that really was moving from office to office that happened to be the tea lady and cleaner. Um, and in fact, we sent out a note saying, if you're willing to tell us, let us know um, if you've been vaccinated. And if you haven't been vaccinated, why not? And if you want to, can we assist you in getting the vaccination? Um, and that was her answer. She wanted to, at the end of the day, have the vaccination, but didn't have the wherewithal to work out where it was. Um, taking off work on that day and whatever. So we arranged that. In fact, that memo got answered by everyone else by saying we've been vaccinated. So we've got everyone in our staff now that's had um, two or three vaccinations. Uh, the tea lady, she's now had three, um, and she's very happy that she had three, although um, her church has caused a little bit of problem with her. Um, I've had to contact, um, you know, it was a pastor or something to that effect. Uh, to explain that it's not fair to pick on her. That's what she decided to do. And we didn't put any pressure on her as a job. So go back to the mandatory vaccination consultation process. Obviously, people who choose not to be vaccinated for various reasons, they are emotional, one of them. Religious, it's a big one. Bodily integrity, constitutional rights, and health issues. Um, now, all those have to be taken into account. The one that is going to create the real problem is emotional because that one doesn't stand good in law at all. So if someone says, oh, you know, I don't like it, I'm scared, or I'm, I, I, I feel that uh, this gonna, they're going to put a microchip and control me. Um, uh, we had a wonderful one where a um, fellow had heard and we had a good laugh with I spoke to him. He was in an engineering workshop. His friends had told him that if he has the vaccination, he's going to hear Radio Wuhan in his ear every morning. Um, <laughs> I quite enjoyed that. And I said, well, I've had it and I haven't got it. You know what station it's on. So uh, we, we had a good laugh and he went and had his uh, vaccination. So you've got the, the real issues. And that's bodily integrity, religious, constitutional rights and health issues. Those have to be taken into account. You can't just poo-poo them, especially the religious. I mean, you, you can't go to um, a former chief justice and tell him that, um, forget about it, it's all nonsense, because he really thinks that there's a triple seven, triple six. Um, I don't know if you remember that call made by Judge Mohueng Mohueng, and he said that it's the call of the devil. Uh, he believes that, and I can't argue with that. You can't argue with belief. Um, and at the end of the day, you've got to see if you can accommodate him um, with that belief. So you must take those into account. But they can't be the be-all and e-all, be-all and end-all. You have to weigh up the two hands. The one hand is the individual rights and their reasons. The other hand is absolutely clear. It's not only the individual rights, but it's got to be the operational requirements. Now, just to also tell you what an interesting judge up in Gauteng, who's the deputy president of the Gauteng court, said that the rights of the group trump the rights of the individual. Just remember that because the rights of the individual will be trampled on in certain circumstances. I'm not going to discuss here today because it's not in my purview and really not within my understanding as to whether the vaccine works or not. That's not, not the issue. The issue here is that our government has said 
that the vaccine is one of the principal ways in which you can fight the spread of the virus and you can fight the severity of the virus. That's what the government said. We have to accept that. We've got no choice. Maybe medical science in 10 years' time will tell us, no, it didn't. Maybe medical science will tell us something else, that the vaccine maybe was bad for you. It gave you um, arthritis in your toes. I don't know. But the reality is that we, as lawyers and as the courts and as the arbitrators and the Department of Employment and Labor, accept what medical science is telling us right now. And that is the vaccine is a very good shield against the spread and the severity. And that shield has to be used in terms of the health and safety regulations because the health and safety regulations tell us quite clearly that an employer is obliged to do everything in their power within reason to ensure that the rest of the staff stay healthy. And of course, your visitors and your customers and whatever type of business you're in. So taking those two factors, one, science tells us it's good, the vaccine is good, and two, the regulations tell us we need to protect. If you add those two together, the vaccine is the answer. It's the only real answer we have other than the protocols, that's uh, sanitizing, social distancing, masks, etc. And then, of course, uh, staying away, although they're not telling us to do that anymore because the government is telling us, uh, like I said when I started off, that if you don't have symptoms, even though you've got COVID, pitch up at work, uh, which I find um, a little bit like Alice in Wonderland, but there you have it. Um, and I've written quite a lot on that. Um, I don't know if anyone might have seen that. So you've got to weigh up those personal rights Go through it again, religious, bodily integrity, constitutional rights, health issues against your operational requirements. And now once you married it up, you've got to do it through consultation. It's not through negotiation. I had a group of staff, in fact, on Monday, this week on Monday, who told me we are negotiating with our employer um, as to whether we're going to take the vaccine and whether it's going to become mandatory or not. And I said, no, you're not negotiating. The employer makes a decision at the end of the day after taking into account the response from the staff in general, their spokesperson, which might be a trade union, in that case it was, and then from individuals. So you'd have to have individual discussion with everyone. It becomes a real problem if you happen to be, for instance, UCT or Old Mutual. Um, how do you have individual discussions? But they have open portals where people can feed in what their personal issues are, but then you've got to weigh it up with poppies so where people say it's none of your business. There will be a problem, of course, where if you say it's none of your business um, and they say, well, we don't want you on these premises if you haven't been vaccinated and you come in, what you're really doing is you're giving them a message that you are vaccinated. And if you're giving them that message and they find out that you aren't, then they can probably dismiss you for lying not for not having the vaccination. So be careful of that as well. Let's go back quickly to the consolidated direction on occupational health and safety measures in certain workplaces, which came in effect on the 11th of June, 21. So that's been in effect since last year, June. And that entitles employers to implement a mandatory vaccination policy for certain category of employers. That's there. That's part of our law. Like I said, because of the medical science and because medical science tells us that the vaccine is effective, that's part of our law. Let me, get, let me tell you an example where our law took us in one direction and then reversed it very quickly thereafter, well, not very quickly, a decade later. You might recall a, um, and that's quick for, for law, a decade, but you might recall a case of Prince versus the Law Society of the Cape Province. Prince was a Rastafarian. Prince went and studied law, and he passed his exams and now wanted to be admitted as an attorney. When the issue about fit and proper was then presented to the court, it came out that Prince smoked dope, dacha, 
every evening as part of his religious rites. So he had religious integrity in mind, and he smoked dacha to pray as part of his religion. He was a Rastafarian. The Law Society opposed his admittance as an attorney, this is about 15 years ago now, on the basis that they didn't think he was fit and proper because he was a drug addict. He had drugs every night. Dacha. And the courts accepted what medical science had to say at that stage is that it made you a person who, whose mind was interfered with and he wasn't fit and proper to be an attorney. And to be an attorney, you have to be an officer of the court and they didn't want someone who was a drug addict. That He was turned down. He, he opposed it. He lost his case and he didn't get admitted as an attorney. Ten years thereafter, he applied again. And this time, the medical evidence showed that it didn't somehow subvert his mind. Um, I, I don't want to go through the, but there was quite a lot of medical evidence that was given and that he could practice quite happily as an attorney. Um, even if he smoked uh, a joint every night, it wasn't a problem. Of course, there are many attorneys that, that did, but they didn't come forward and say that they smoked dope every night. Um, I remember having to get admitted as a, I got admitted as an advocate in Grahamstown and I had a, an advocate representing me presented at the court in Grahamstown. Um, he shall remain nameless, a wonderful friend of mine. And when it came to the issue of fit and proper, uh, he presented to the court that, Judge, we might have a problem because I'm not sure that he's fit and proper. He had told the judge beforehand that he was going to pull my leg. Um, I'm sitting, standing in the court hearing this for the first time, and I thought, my word. And I started sweating right through my jacket. They then had a good laugh because I was completely white in the face when they said, no, he is fit and proper. So I know what it feels like when someone says you're not fit and proper. Okay, so taking into account the consolidated directions of occupational health and safety, taking into account your consultation process, where do we go from there? And what is happening is, of course, thousands and thousands of employees are being affected by this where people are saying, I don't want to take the vaccination, they're then getting dismissed. How do they get dismissed? Well, again, the courts haven't explained what's the best way. Do you just say to them, we're going to have a disciplinary hearing because you're now not competent to fulfill the position? Do you go through a retrenching process? In other words, a no-fault dismissal. Uh, we don't know yet. I've been recommending a no-fault dismissal because especially with people who are telling us are religious, bodily integrity, constitutional health issues. What happens if my doctor says to me that, Michael, you can't have the vaccination because you've got some rare disease and we're not sure how the vaccination is going to react with your body or something, something like that. I then go to my employer and say, well, my medical advice is I mustn't have it. What do I do now? Um, it would be terrible just to dismiss me then and say you're on the street. And I think it would be fairer to go through that consultation process and then retrench me with a package. And so it's no fault, a no fault dismissal. Not my fault that I'm sick, although in my particular instance, it's self-inflicted, but it wouldn't be a fault uh, that I couldn't take the vaccination. And like I said, there is no legal precedent yet. We're still waiting for the Labor Court. We're still waiting for the Constitutional Court. But what we do know is that the courts are going to very carefully look at the risk assessment that we've heard from them that you do in your own business, and they're going to carefully look at the consultation process that you had with each individual. So the process is just as important as the actual event, the process of how you got there to make it mandatory. Um, and so we need to have a look. If you look at a previous case, it was GK versus Nadaka Security, NDAKA Security and Services, where the employee was employed as a health and safety. I'm just having a look at the note here, practitioner, and he wasn't allowed to access the SASL site um, for various reasons. Um, I don't know if anyone's been to visit the SASL site or if anyone's been to visit, for instance, engine offices. When you go in, you have to go through a breathalyzer. I did this in town recently. I had to go and see people, senior management um, at an oil company. And as I came in, they wanted to do a breathalyzer. And I said, well, what's that all about? 
And they said, no, we want to see if you've been drinking, uh, if you had any alcohol, because we're not having anyone on site who've had any alcohol. I said, you're joking. It was eight o'clock in the morning. They said, well, sorry, you've got to either do that or don't come in. Uh, I couldn't then say I've got bodily integrity, I've got constitutional rights. Can you imagine that the security would lead me out by the ear? Um, so that, that case really showed very carefully that never mind GK's rights. They wouldn't allow him on site. If he wasn't allowed on site, he then lost his job because he couldn't do his job without being on site. And that case has been law for many years. We've also got the TM versus the Gold Rush group. Uh, where an employee was at that point refused to be vaccinated was for something else. I can't remember what it was, but that dismissal in the court was deemed to be fair. We've got Escort Limited versus Mahotsi, which was also a labor court, uh, where, again, he refused to take um, certain medication, and again, he was dismissed and he lost his case. So we've had a whole lot of them. I've been through Prince with you, where they reversed it, but we've had a whole lot of cases where you have at the end of the day um, to understand that I know which way our courts are going to go. Um, I can see that coming a mile off. We don't have to wait too long for that. Look, we've also got to have reasonable accommodation because if the individual comes forward and says, listen, I'm the bookkeeper. I don't have to be on site. I have been doing, and through the lockdown, I've been doing my job absolutely perfectly at home. I've had no problems with uh, the way I've performed. I've had no problems with the input that I've been getting from people and me in return. And you need to reasonably accommodate me. It doesn't help to say, well, we feel like you to be here. Um, you need to be able to explain why the person should be on site. Obviously, the tea lady can't do the job virtually, but the bookkeeper might be able to do it. There might be certain instances you can't. Um, I'm for, for one, for instance, uh, we've been running most of our arbitrations on Zoom and Microsoft Teams. I personally think I'm much better at cross-examining people when I can watch them eyeball to eyeball, not through the Zoom. I'm a bit of a bully, so I like to have the witness there that I can almost grab them by the throat. And I've been fighting with the CCMA that I object to having this done through Zoom. Um, but that's just my personal style. I, you know, I like to be overbearing and I want to push the witness and I can't do that on the screen. And so you need the reasonable accommodation. And I read, every employer shall provide and maintain as far as reasonably practical a working environment that is safe and without a risk to the health of the employees. Section 8.2 reads, and I'll quote it again, taking such steps as may be, reason as be reasonably be practical to eliminate or mitigate any hazard or potential hazard to the safety or health of employees before resulting in personal, in personal injury to any other employee or visitor or staff. Then 9.1 of the OSHA Act, uh, Occupational Health and Safety of South Africa, every employer shall conduct his undertaking in such a manner to ensure that as far as reasonably practical, that persons other than those in his employee who may be directly affected by his activities are not thereby exposed to hazard to their health and safety. So again, it's not just your staff, you're protecting the society and you must remember that. I must tell you that the labor court is gonna take those particular quotes to heart, and I can't see the Labor Court reversing that. I know that the government has now put out that statement, um, as I'm coming to the end of what I'm going to say, that if you don't have any symptoms, go ahead and go to work. Um, and I think that's gonna be challenged as well at the end of the day. I think it's ridiculous. We've got the Popia Act, as I said to you, the Popia is a problem. Um, because what happens if the staff member says, I have rights before I tell you whether I'm vaccinated or not? I don't know the right way around that. Other than to say that I would ask the staff then to sign a statement saying that they have no 
reason to believe that they will be of any risk to anyone else, either the staff or visitors to the premises, uh, and thereby almost indicating that they are vaccinated. And there will be problems if, in fact, it turns out they're not, and they come down uh, with COVID-19 and it then spreads at the workplace. This issue obviously might become obsolete um, as the um, severity of COVID-19 is dropping. Um, it might eventually result in just flu-like symptoms and nothing worse than flu. But on, that on the other hand, when I have a staff member who phones in and said they've got bad flu, long before COVID-19, I we used to say, don't come to work, we don't all want flu. Um, that's not so great. Uh, just don't pitch up, and they know that. So even if it's just flu-like symptoms, I don't think it's great having people at work. But on the other hand, you have people who um, make use of it and pretend that they've got flu-like symptoms. So you've got to be careful about that as well. At the end of the day, productivity is really low in South Africa. I think we're the second lowest in the world with regard to low productivity. Um, so we need to watch that as well. The reality is um, that when someone does spread COVID-19 at the workplace, you are, as an employer, you're protected. You report it immediately to the compensation fund. You have indemnity from the compensation fund. They would pay for that employee to have private um, medical advice, go to a private medical institution or hospital if need be, and would even step in and pay for their salary under, under certain circumstances. So the employer's got indemnity. However, that indemnity is well nigh useless because the compensation fund is so useless. So they give you the indemnity and then they don't pay. And who ends up paying is the employer. So if you need to send your employee to a private doctor, the private doctor is probably not going to see you because he's not getting paid by the compensation fund. So the employer will have to pay the private doctor and try and claim it back from the compensation fund, which might take anything up to 20 years. I've got a case now, which is now had its 21st birthday, um, where the compensation fund hasn't paid. The guy lost his eye in Port Elizabeth, and they put in a claim 21 years ago, and we just think I'd get paid now. Uh, he's long since retired, but now they're paying back his medical costs. So it's taken 21 years in that particular case. It is an extraordinary case, and I got involved uh, being an MP because he had no joy from his lawyers or the courts. So just to wind up um, uh, in this exercise and me chatting to you, to summarize, the vaccine is still effective in the eyes of the medical profession. The vaccine is something that is called for in terms of you protecting your staff. You can make it mandatory only after doing a risk assessment and after consultation, and preferably consultation with each individual. So thank you for listening to me, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are. I've had a few questions of my own, but go ahead. Thank you, Michael. Um, that was incredibly insightful and um, a lot of detail for us to, to consider. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat box. So would you like me to read them out to you? Yeah, because I'm not ambidextrous. So, okay. <laughs> so I try, I try to read it as, as you saw my thumb, but go ahead. Okay. It's really tough in the retail space when you want to make vaccinations compulsory, but on the other side of the coin, the regulations say that you can come to work if you're positive, but showing no symptoms. So basically you can't come to work if you're not vaxxed, but you can come to work being positive with, symptom, with no symptoms. So how does one deal with that situation? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I, I think it's a bit of a topsy-turvy world. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and that's why I've been recommending to my clients that they ignore that regulation completely and tell the staff to stay home. Once they've been, whether they're vaccinated or not is irrelevant. Once you've got 
this, the, you don't have symptoms, but you've been told that you are now positive, stay at home. Take a week off. Relax. Watch some TV or read a book. Um, I, I've been very strong on that one because even if you are vaccinated, we, we're hearing some people that are getting, still getting pretty sick uh, from the COVID-19. So I can't, I can't explain that. I've asked the minister to explain it, who then muted me um, in a, a portfolio committee meeting where I said it doesn't make sense uh, that we've been still telling people to wear masks at the moment, and yet when you know someone has actually got the COVID-19 virus, and he's act the virus is active, and you're telling them to come pop into work and sit right next to me. So I don't know. You've got a bigger problem in the retail space because you can't, at the moment in South Africa, you can't stop your customers coming in or unvaccinated, and you don't know whether they've got COVID. Um, you just don't know. It. Retail space is probably the most difficult one. But then our government is full of nonsense. You might recall right near the beginning um, of COVID-19 pandemic, people were told that they could go to Cape Union Mart and buy a fleece jersey, but you weren't allowed to buy a short sleeve T-shirt unless you were going to wear the short sleeve T-shirt as an undergarment. Um, and this came out from our communist minister at the time it made so much sense that it was almost laughable if it wasn't, uh, it wasn't real. When I told people around the world that you couldn't buy a short sleeve T-shirt, but you could go on the same shelf and buy a jersey, they said, no, man, you're making things up. So this is our government. Our government has now said that you're still going to wear a mask, but if you've got COVID-19, you can pitch up to work and sit right next to someone. Really, really sharp. There you have it. I can't give you an answer. It's so contradictory. It just, it uh, just fascinates me. Anyway, Hazel, uh, you want to ask a question? I'd like to. Thank you. Michael, thanks for that. What happens in a situation when an employee is refusing to have a vaccination due to medical reasons? We have requested documentation, which is not valid, from the actual medical doctor, and she works directly with somebody that has a very serious immune system and comorbidities, and there's no other position available for them within the organization. Uh, and you, I presume you can't accommodate her elsewhere, like working from home or something like that. And if you can't, I personally think, well, if you can show that the medical certificate's a lie, then you would dismiss her for that reason, because that, you know, the, the cornerstone of the employment relationship is trust. That's the cornerstone. And if you now can't trust her because she's either got a sham certificate or she's got um, a doctor who isn't really a doctor or something of that nature, then you would dismiss for that reason, which makes it a lot easier to defend. Otherwise, I would go through a retrenchment program and say, look, you know, I fully understand that you can't have the, I now almost believe your certificate. I believe your health condition doesn't allow you to have it. Our operational requirements don't allow us to have someone who can't be at the office. And so we're now going to go through. It's like a, a retrenchment program because my driver loses his license because he got caught drunk and driving. So he can't, his license has been endorsed for two years. So he's no more driver. I can't accommodate him elsewhere. Then I must retrench him. Um, he was caught drunk and driving. That's the end of the road. I don't want to point fingers at him. I don't know why he was drinking. I don't know what the circumstances were. Um, he might be an alcoholic or whatever it might be. It might not be his fault. And so therefore we retrench. And that's what I'm asking you to do is to retrench because I still don't think it's right to have someone who thinks that his or her rights trump the rights of the others. That's not fair at all. It's like everyone says I have a freedom of speech. But freedom of speech isn't absolute. I can't shout in a crowded cinema. I can't shout fire where everyone then rushes to the door and people get hurt and there's no fire. I was only joking. Um, that's not freedom of speech. So it overrides that particular issue. I hope that helps you, but it's very sad for the individual who has to go, and especially if they have true medical reasons. Um, but that's life. You're, you've got to protect the rest of your staff and your customers and your... Uh, everyone that uses you through the through the business, you've got to protect them as well. Thank you. Hopefully, Thank I'll, you hopefully I've answered. You have. Thank you. Yeah. 
Thanks, Michael. Um, Michael, can you just, I know you mentioned this earlier, but just to, for us to have a top of mind, can you please relist the reasons people use for not being vaccinated? Okay, th thank you. I see that was in the chat as well, but I'll just oh, listen sorry. again. Um, it's, uh, one of them is religious, which is the most difficult one to handle. The other one is bodily integrity, that I don't want, I don't want something in my body. Um, some people won't even take the measles vaccination. They won't give it to their children. The other one is constitutional rights, because the Constitution does give you right over your body. And, and the next one is health, um, which we've just spoken about. And then the final one is emotional. Some people just don't like the idea. I've had quite a few people, and especially, I don't know what it is, but we found it quite a bit on the Cape Flats where people are chicken. Um, they, I mean, I've had a few people telling me, but near Khot, I'm not having them stick anything into my arm. Uh, people are actually scared of having an injection altogether. Um, and I understand that. I mean, I, I must tell you, I go into a complete state when I have to go to the dentist. So, um, I understand the emotional issue as well, but that's not an argument. So those are the issues that have been arisen. Um, and then, of course, the radio Wuhan in his ear. Uh, that was the one. one but I love that one. Thanks, Michael. Um, Mornay wants to know, um, does my employee have the right to ask for a copy of the risk assessment? Yes. Yes, they do. Um, and I would conduct a risk assessment. I think it's quite useful anyway, um, because the Department of Employment and Labor are, in fact, trying to get the inspectors together to start looking at risk assessments because of the occupational health and safety regulations. Mostly in uh, businesses that have machinery and um, that sort of thing, they are looking at risk assessment. I think it's worthwhile doing. And it's also worthwhile appointing someone, doesn't matter how small your office is, as the person who's in charge of risk, that they would have the phone number of, a, of an ambulance and they would have a phone number of a doctor and they would have a look at where there could be possibly risks. It's always good to have someone like that uh, we've got someone in our staff, and we're tiny. We're probably the smallest law firm in the country. But we've got one of the ladies at our reception who actually has, she was a, initially, she was a nurse. So she we've pointed her as our risk assessment um, person, and she has a medical aid box and all the phone numbers and that sort of thing. Okay, great. Um, there's now a question from... Jeremy Phillips, I don't know if he wants to ask it. It might be a bit better if it comes directly from him, if Jeremy wants to unmute. Otherwise, I'm happy to, to, to read it out. Um, thank you very much, very interesting. Uh, to what extent are the procedures prescribed in the consolidated OHS direction obligatory? Annex to C to the direction which deals with uh, mandatory vaccinations, is headed as a guideline. Does this imply some amount of flexibility? Yeah, a lot of flexibility. Um, guidelines are just guidelines for you. Uh, the courts have a look at it, and they have a look at it in terms of your own operational requirements. That's why I said to you, first have a look at your operational requirements, and then you try and marry that to the guidelines and people have different, different ways of doing things. Um, for instance, uh, like I mentioned, how, how is it going to be possible for Old Mutual to interview every single staff member when they've got 5,000 staff? Um, so they, they've got guidelines, and those guidelines are merely the template as to where you move from. But remember, when you land up at the CCMA or at a bargaining council, you've got a commissioner. The commissioners are not normally people who are qualified lawyers. And so they, and it's a bit sad to say this, but they use a tick box exercise. Even with the retrenchment, they use a tick box exercise. So there's a guideline put out in terms of Schedule 8 of the Labor Relations Act on how you would retrench. Those guidelines have become a little bit more powerful than what they were set out to be because the commissioners are using it and they're saying, okay, 0.1 tick, 0.2 tick. 
And in fact, I found even some judges using it. So be careful that you complete, you can't completely ignore the guidelines, but you can explain on each guideline that you had a look at it, you thought what was the best way to involve your business in it, and that's what you did. So I'm not advising you to ignore them, but I am telling you there's only a guideline. Um, we've now got a question from Philip Rubin. I think he's going to unmute. Hi, Philip. Unmute. Yeah, I've got it. Yeah. Hi, hi, Michael. Thank you so much for the information. Um, your information seems to be, or your, yeah, seems to be mostly around employees. But what about uh, where we, where one might have contracts with with a company to do some sort of service on site? Um, and it, you know, and and hmm. is there any kind of context that should that could be applicable? Because uh, I've got one client that sort of won't let me on site unless I've got proof of vaccination. Um, is there yeah. any way around it? Uh, is there any way to contest it? And it's an accounting firm. So, you know, uh, it's a large accounting firm, which is only probably about 10% in the office. And in fact, you know, I'm guaranteed to go near no staff members or anything. Is there any way uh, to you, contest it? Well, there is, but be careful. And I'll tell you why, <clears throat> because I'm using employees as the template because there they've got more rights than independent contractors. You're an independent contractor. You're going in to someone else's office and providing a service. That service yeah. is at the behest of the person signing the contract or giving you the, the work to do. They can cancel for almost any reason. And if they're telling you that they are insisting on you being vaccinated, they will probably cancel the contract and your rights are pretty thin. You don't have rights like you have rights under the Labor Relations Act or the Basic Conditions of Employment Act. So again, that's a real problem. So for instance, there's a restaurant in Cape Town that won't let you come and eat there unless you show them your vaccination certificate. And people were up in arms. And the restaurant said, well, why are you up in arms? Just don't come and eat here. Go eat elsewhere. Infect them. So... Um, I, you don't want to put your business at risk um, by saying, no, I'm not going to be vaccinated and I refuse to be vaccinated on certain grounds, but um, you don't have a right to tell me I must be vaccinated. What I would do in those circumstances is I would consult with them on the basis of that you don't go near anyone and that you're normally there when the majority of the people are away and that you would uh, I don't know, you can offer them certain, a certain solace by saying, I'll give you a certificate to say that I'm clear, like you would do on the airlines. I think those, those are becoming valid and cheaper and for longer times. So I would try and find a way around that, massage it. But quite frankly, if they don't want you in there, they can just say you're not coming in. Just like the oil company wouldn't let me in if I didn't have the breathalyzer, um, to show that I haven't had a drink at eight o'clock in the morning. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great, there are no more questions. Um, so Michael, is, are there any questions that you've been asked um, that maybe haven't come up in our conversation that you feel it's important to, to mention to our group? Now, there is one that comes out of Philip's question, um, and, and that I've been finding a lot of. And many employers are saying, all right, if you refuse to be vaccinated, we can understand because you've got one of the real issues, religious, bodily integrity, constitutional or health. But we want you to provide a COVID-free certificate that you've been tested and that you're COVID-free we want you to provide that every Monday morning at your own expense. Now, they're still quite expensive. I'm not sure what they're costing at the moment. At one stage of about, I think there were 700 rand or something. And so it's quite an expensive business. Plus, you have to go and get it done. Um, they're all coming down and they're all getting cheaper and they're all being, you can get it quite quickly. Um, but yes, what, what has actually happened is that many people are now insisting it, and that's created a problem with the trade union. So 
just to answer that issue that's come up quite often, um, there, there, is another, there is another issue, and that is um, I'm finding that some staff have gone to a trade union, and in fact, one of the political parties, the EFF, have now stood in for staff who said, we're not going to be vaccinated, and how dare you dismiss us. And the EFF have threatened to come and invade someone's work premises. Uh, we've had to get an interdict um, against them for that. Um, so they've stepped in, but we're the trade unions. We can't, we can't interdict a trade union. And they've put it down as a demand that you won't insist on mandatory vaccination. We're still going through the consultation process with that trade union. Again, that's created havoc at the workplace because they've got about 400 people. The trade union represents about a quarter of their staff, and they're giving a message out to, the, to their members they don't need to be vaccinated. So we, we're handling it carefully enough to try and convince the shop stewards that the union itself is wrong, um, and I think we're getting somewhere. So that's, a, that's a big, another big issue that is coming out uh, where you get these uh, joint negotiations um, that are coming through trade unions or political party. I see there was one other that came in there. I think Ruben, Philip Ruben again. Um, uh, from Jeremy. Jeremy, he, sorry, uh, he's got a problem with his, his microphone. That's why he can't ask it. Uh, so okay. his question is around, can an employee refuse to come to work if the company has not adopted a mandatory vaccination policy and there are unvaccinated people at work? No, they can't. They, they can't do that. They have to go one step further. They have to show that you're not following the protocols. And the protocols are not saying you must be vaccinated. The protocols are saying that you must have sanitizers, social distancing, and masks. That's what the protocols are. And if you can show that your company is doing that and they're still refusing to come in, then you can go through an exercise where you give them warnings and then finally dismissal. They can't, an employee can't enforce mandatory vaccination on the employers of, of that particular workplace. They can't enforce it. Um, it, it can be enforced the other way around, like I said, it's a consultation process. It'll be an interesting court case that though. Thanks, Michael. Um, we've got another one coming through from Monet. Um, with changing your company policy by implementing mandatory vaccinations, is that essentially implementing a unilateral change of contract? No, it isn't, but it's adding another policy. So, for instance, uh, we've just negotiated a, a sexual harassment policy at a company, and we finished it yesterday. And what we did was we had negotiated that with the trade union and a staff representative um, who were talking to the non-trade union staff. And once we had finished those discussions and negotiations, we then put together the policy. We got it signed off by the two groups. We then sent it to each individual saying, here with a new policy. And we've sent it to the individual saying, if you've got any comments, you have 48 hours to make your comments in writing via the email to the company before we actually implement. That's what I'm doing. So not a unilateral change at all. It is a change to the policies, but it's not a change to the contract. The contracts always have new policies coming on all the time. Um, so uh, you have new policies every, every few months in big companies where they have policies on smoking, they have policies on pregnancy, all those things are being updated and changed all the time. It doesn't, doesn't change the contract per se. I mean, it's like giving everyone an increase. It doesn't change the contract per se. It's, everyone gets a 5% increase. Thanks, Michael. Um, to your point on the cost of COVID testing, if no union, then how do you deal with this? Must employee carry that cost or employer if insisting? No, no, I, I would say if you've got, once you've got a man, once you've been through the whole exercise that we just discussed this morning, once you've got that exercise and you put it in place and you now have a mandatory vaccination, 
but you're willing as an alternative to have the testing done, that's the employee's cost. Some companies have said, we'll pay, but I mean, it shouldn't be for you to pay. And it's quite an onerous payment. I don't know what the cost actually is, but what companies are doing is they are saying to the employees, as an alternative, if you choose to be tested once a week, well, your cost, you do it, come present it to us. Great. Michael, thank you. It has been so informative. And I, from the questions in the conversation, I hear people have got a lot of information from you. So grateful thanks for your time, your guidance, and just sharing all this information with us. I will share the recording link with everyone early next week. So thank you for joining us. Keep safe and, and all the best. COVID free. COVID thank free. You. Absolutely. Good health. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.